I walk around in my neighborhood and I've designed all these things that live there. Well, hi. Welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast presented by Hippo Direct. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur or innovator every single Wednesday morning who's turning wild ideas into wild growth. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, podcasting due to Hippo Direct, and you can reach me at max at hippodirect.com for help bringing your podcast to life and using it as a business building tool. This is episode number 110, 110, and today's guest is Paula Scher. Paula is one of the most influential graphic designers of all time, and she is principal at Pentagram, where she joined in 1991 and was the first ever woman to be named principal. You have definitely seen her work at least somewhere. She is responsible for the logo of Citibank, as well as the graphics and branding for everything from Shake Shack to the Highline to the Public Theater, Microsoft Windows, the list goes on and on and on. She has been featured in a Netflix docu-series. Oh, and she is responsible for that famous Boston album cover. Let's peek into the mind of Paula. Enjoy the show. Alrighty, we are here with the legendary of legendary graphic designers, Paula Cher. Paula, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Pretty good is a pretty good place to start. And yeah, I think so. I am blown away by your background. I mean, obviously your your career and your impact speaks for itself. So we're gonna get into a lot of what you've done in the graphic design space and the business space. But to start off, I am going to ask you a weird question because that's what I do. When you were starting out your career making album covers, think back to that and then think to now. How does it make you feel that? some of these albums you designed are now literally viewed as like a two by two inch square thing on someone's phone. I marvel at it. I, I just, I marvel at two things. One that it became this little teeny thing though. I could have predicted it when it became smaller to become DVDs because I quit the record industry at that period because 12 inches struck, you know, shrunk to six. But on the other hand, I'm utterly charmed that, I can go to my iPhone and call up a piece of music I know perfectly well and see a cover I designed in the 70s. It breaks my heart. It's lovely. It breaks my heart. It's lovely. How much has design changed since when you started your career? Um, Marketing grew as a business. Uh, It used to be that when I designed record covers, there really wasn't much of a marketing department at uh, CBS Records, which was Columbia and Epic Records primarily, and a bunch of little labels. The people who worked in something called marketing were called uh, product managers, and they tended to like to hang around with rock and roll bands. They really weren't marketing specialists. Uh, So they were mostly facilitating it. And when I had things, when I had to show things, it was really to the recording artists who were were brought to the label. And if they liked it, the cover got made. And if they didn't like it, the cover didn't get made. Now, of course, I work with giant committees on virtually everything. So it was really much easier back then. How does that change how you approach the actual design? Well, it makes it take long, take longer because you have to really think about every single decision you're making while you're designing to show that it relates to somebody's idea of what their positioning is. And, and you're trying to make an aesthetic connection to an abstract thought, which is essentially not scientific, though everybody wants to believe it's scientific. Um, back in the day when I was doing record covers, nobody cared about being proven it. And, and, you know, we put these things out and they, they would sell all over the world. It was completely global. I mean, I'll go to European or Asian countries and see records, records that I designed in uh, old record stores, which exist everywhere. It's really rather amazing. It is to see something like that all around the world, especially back when the world was severely less connected. I know you've talked about it thousands of times, so we don't need to go into it, but everybody knows about your work on the Boston album. And I know you have a complicated relationship with that. Uh, instead of diving into that one, what's an album cover that you designed 
other than the Boston album that you think back very fondly of? I loved a series of albums I did for Bob James. Uh, he had a label called Tappan Zee Records and um, they were all designed as a series. They were small objects blown up at 12 and a half by 12 and a half inches. There was a, a big nickel, there was a matchbook cover, uh, there was a football. They had different names to them and that, that sort of designated uh, what the cover art would be. But the nickel was Bob James' fifth album. And the matchbook had two skinny matches and it was for an album he did with Earl Klug and it was called One on One. They were, they were charming, they were smart and they're great looking. People collect them and bring them around for me to sign them. Let's skip forward a bit and get a little bit further in your career. When you eventually joined Pentagram, obviously very, you know, first female principal ever at Pentagram, a real trailblazer in the space. When you look back and really think of when you hit your stride, what was the moment that you knew graphic design was right for you? I I actually found that out at college. I was, uh, it, the way Tyler was set up, that you, your first two years of college, you took everything. Um, you took printmaking, you took sculpture, you took metalwork, really every form of the arts was explored. And I was terrible at everything. Um, until my junior year, when I got into a course called graphic design. Now I had taken basic design in my freshman year and hated it because I thought it was about being neat and sort of organizing things uh, in the style of the way they taught design at Basel in Switzerland where you moved a black square around a white page and I, I didn't see the benefit in it. But graphic design was about ideas and that was terrific for me. And that's when I fell in love with my profession. What is it about ideas that appeals to you? Work that you relate to is created through having an idea about it. Um, you know, that, that there is something that holds the piece together and it's generally a thought that's executed in a way that, that can explain something or be deliberately mysterious or be funny or uh, be outrageous. Um, but there's first the idea and then the execution of the idea. Uh, an idea that's a smart idea and well executed is really hard to beat in everything. Yeah, and there's always the debate about how valuable is the idea versus the execution, but you can't have one without the other if you're, if you're going to make something a success. How did you hear about Pentagram in the first place before you even knew that you would join them? I knew about Pentagram um, actually very early on in my career when I learned about it at CBS as a London-based business. And they were parallel uh, in the time they were formed uh, to my husband's business, which was Pushpin Studios. My husband is Seymour Quast, and he was partners with Milton Glaser. And they founded this design firm, which was incredibly influential when I was in art school. And their peers were, were these designers named Colin Forbes and Alan Fletcher, who lived in London. And they knew them. So I knew about that as a level of design, that there were, there were a number of design firms at that time. I mean, Shemayef and Geismar was a little bit earlier and older. Um, there was Pushpin in the States and Pentagram in England, and there was um, Total Design in uh, the Netherlands. And I just knew about these as a young designer. As soon as you heard about them, did you aspire to, to work for them one day? No, uh, they were in London. Uh, Colin <laughs> Forbes, who was the, one of the founders of Pentagram, started the New York office uh, in 1978. He came over to found an office here. He was, um, for a period of time, you know, a one-man band, and it didn't make a lot of noise in New York. And uh, I met him in the early 80s when I was on the board of the American Institute of Graphic Arts, and he was, he was vice president and then president. And I thought he was a really, really smart man and liked him, but I didn't aspire to join Pentagram then either because I was, you know, in a youth-oriented culture, and I perceived them as a little fusty. It would be interesting to uh, 
get back in, in your mind back then, knowing now that you have joined Pentagram and the, the amazing career you've had there, what, what your younger self would have said? Well, you know, it's the, it's the um, job of youth to over, overthrow the older generation and then join them later when they get old. <laughs> right. <laughs> Talk about how much they learn from them. You know, I mean, that, that we all do that because we, we all start out as a little bit bratty. And then, and then um, start to understand our profession better. You learn graphic design truly from the moment you walk into the arena. And what matters is, is what your understanding of it at that point you enter. You really don't know the history. You've learned it a little bit, but it doesn't resonate with you because you didn't experience for real. You experience what you see at the moment in time that you walk in and they become your heroes or villains until you begin to work and develop a broader understanding of how the whole community fits together. That takes years. When you look at those early years at Pentagram, what are some key moments where you felt like you really were hitting your stride or you maybe you found an aha and, ooh, this is the type of graphic design that I'm really good at or I just have a knack for? You know, when I, when I joined Pentagram, I, I had very small projects that I brought with me for my other business, which was really uh, doing uh, promotional pieces and publication or um, book jacket design. And those were the sorts of things I did for the first year, and they were really very small projects in relationship to Pentagram. And it wasn't that I walked in the door and immediately got these big corporate identities. Um, I had done a small identity for... Um, Bart College uh, Center for Curatorial Studies, which was really a call I got in my old business, Copel and Share, and ended up doing at Pentagram. And then the second project for this, this college uh, was um, from uh, the School of Decorative and uh, Fine Arts. It was a, a, a school for collectors, and it was called the Brad Graduate Center. And I did an identity for the Brad Graduate Center, and the, the woman who ran the department was named Susan Soros, and she was a close friend of another woman named Ellen Futter, who had just taken over the Museum of Natural History. So I uh, was hired with my partner, Michael Gericke, who actually had signage experience. I had none to work on an identity and a temporary signage system for the Museum of Natural History. And one job led to another, but the jobs really came from my client relationships that were previous. The same thing happened after that project, I began to get calls for sort of not-for-profit businesses or businesses in the arts, and also to design the New York Sunday Times Magazine with the in-house art director, Janet Froelich. And all these things happened about two or three years after I joined Pentagram in 1991, and in 1994, I was asked to redesign the public theater, which was probably, and probably still is, the most, one of the most important jobs of my, my working life, uh, because it was all encompassing, and the relationship has lasted now 27 years. I just wrote a book about it. And there was this project for me that was about New York City as well as about the arts and the theater. And it was about connecting New Yorkers to a place. And I think that's really where I found my strongest voice, which is really somebody who likes to live in the emotional and cultural life of the city. How do you foster these relationships with key clients like that, that can turn into great relationships for multiple decades? Like how do you, what in addition to just putting out great work makes that a powerful, mutually beneficial relationship? If you look at any relationship that between a designer and an organization, you'll usually find that there's one person inside that organization that does it. It's usually a person of power. It, it comes from this, the, the core of a kind of mutual understanding between somebody with the power to make decisions and their designer. And that works in corporate life as well. Um, on anything that I do for a corporation over a period of time, that there was always a person inside who had the power that I had the relationship with. In the making of the thing, something emotional happened where we connected and they developed trust. And if they, that usually lasts until, if, until that person 
loses their power or the designer like gets sloppy and gives up their talent base. I, I don't know how that how the designer actually loses it, but it, it really it really is that relationship that has somewhere somehow frayed that will end that situation. And does that come right from the initial pitch or ideation session? It, that's hard to say. It comes all through all different sorts of things. I mean, I found that the, my best relationships, they always last over time once there's this moment where my partner, who is that client, has come to the understanding that I, have, I so much care about the project that I have their total best interest at heart in everything I'm going to do. And when they can appreciate that and trust it, then the relationship is great. Because then we become collaborators. You know, they, that I, I cease to be somebody commissioned or a, a vendor, which is the worst thing you can really be in that situation and become the true consulting partner. When you look at the public theater, you look at a number of your, your longtime clients or, or most notable works, what sticks out to you is the way that you get insights or unlock what turns out to be the final design? Sometimes it's very intuitive and fast. I mean, I have a 20-year relationship with the High Line, and I, I designed their logo almost immediately uh, by virtue of the fact that it was a favor. Um, they'd come. I never heard of the High Line. Uh, they, want, they told me that there were two uh, people who came out of a, a Chelsea community organization and they had this idea to save this elevated railroad and turn it into a, a new york city park and i thought oh good luck fellows you know i really <laughs> who could believe somebody like that would really be able to pull that off yeah yeah that will never work my they asked me to do it as a pro bono project and and i the only reason i did it was robert Haddon, one of the founders at that particular point in time was working at a place called watch world and he had a store and an identity he wanted me to design and then after he came and we presented work to him. He, co he contacted me to ask me if I would do this free project. And I agreed to do it because I wanted the watch world job. And then, of course, the watch world job never happened. And the High Line is, is uh, you know, New York's most successful tourist attraction. The, the, <laughs> that crazy things happen. I mean, the same thing happened with Shake Shack. Where I, and I, I have a wonderful relationship with Danny Meyer. But, he, you know, he was across the park. And, and they were putting a, a shack in the park, the first one. And the, the people from the park were, didn't want them to do something that wouldn't be elegant enough for the park and, and made them actually come to me, came to me that way. And, and we did the first, the first shack, which is the one in Madison Square Park that everybody knows. So it was a, another pro bono project. And then he decided to make it a national brand. And then it was a real project. That will never work as well. I think that and the High Line both probably turned out way uh, more successful than people would have thought at the start. Absolutely. But they were, they were also game changers. Shake Shack is, invented a whole new category of dining called uh, fast casual. I fast think. casual. Absolutely. You could take the Shake Shack and go eat it on the High Line. <laughs> we just, re we just uh, created a social distancing campaign for the High Line. That really came out beautifully, and it was fun to go back up there and sort of readdress it. We were in the process of re-signing it, because when we did the, the wayfinding signs for the High Line that were designed to go uh, sort of alongside the railing so they didn't block the views, uh, don't work anymore because all the trees grew up around it and all the buildings changed architecturally over the past 20 years since we designed the damn thing. And that you go there and you couldn't see any of the signers, so we got to redo it all. It's very, very amusing. I mean, that, that things evolve and grow. And that's what's sort of fun about maintaining these relationships over periods of time because you have to solve new problems. I mean, if you take the public theater that I designed in 1994 and you find out the way people, those people are going to see it is not in what they promote, but how people pick up what we promote and put it on their Instagram accounts. So you're designing for something that's like, you know, two inches square. It's the same as the record industry. Yeah. I'm fascinated by your ability and, and how often it comes up to when you're doing something that you think is kind of like a smaller project or something pro bono, and then it turns into just like a, a really quick design that, oh my God, that's the one. Let's do something like this. 
what are you looking for in those situations that allows you to spit out something so quick and so creative that just intuitively feels right? Like what, what do you think helps to, to tee you off for that? I think a lot of people are like this. Um, you're not supposed to be because theoretically, you know, I know so many design firms that really try to make the process appear to be much more complicated than it is to earn their dollar. I remember I was in a meeting with a, with a, a firm like that when I was working with, working with them on one of the Citibank projects. And they said, gee, you don't think very much about, you know, earning your hourly rate. But I don't, I don't really think about it in terms of the deliverable. I turn, think about it in terms of the effectiveness of the deliverable. You know, not in terms of how long it took, but how effective it is. I find that as a problem solver, um, I'm absorbing things almost the minute I walk into a door in any client discussion. And before, because they've already sent me some research and I've already done some research online. And I have some basic ideas from the brief they sent me, some basic ideas um, from what I've already seen in the marketplace. And then um, I meet them. And then that's a whole other layer because I have to really find out what the political structure is and who's making the decisions and what voice is the most important voice to listen to in the room. And there always is a most important voice to listen to in the room and to sort of see what the lay of the landscape is. So I've absorbed the information and I write a proposal and in writing a proposal, I have to organize how I'm going to respond to the information. So I've gone through that exercise. And by the time they hire me, I pretty much know how to do the job. And so it's really figuring out, how to take the ideas that I've come up with and get them to see and understand how it relates to them and why it's effective. And that's really 90% of the process. Actually solving it or coming up with the logo or coming up with the design system is the easy part. The hard part is getting a group of people to see why this thing is right for them. And that's really where I spend most of my energy after I've designed it. What is a, a major brand logo or a design that you've worked on that is very recognizable, but people would be shocked at the story behind how it came about? Well, everybody knows the Citibank logo story, I think. I know it from my prep, but you can, uh, you can give a little teaser of it. So uh, Citibank uh, merged with Travelers in the, in the 90s and... Um, uh, it was really that, that Travelers Insurance had actually bought Citibank, I believe, but they kept the name and it was this massive organization that was folding into it. The Travelers had an umbrella that was their logo and City just had some typography in the color blue. And the goal was to create, create a new mark for the organization and then, then a system for it. And I, I found that if you took a lowercase t from certain form of typography, the, uh, the T had a lowercase loop on the bottom. If you looked at the drawing of a lowercase T and you draw the little curve on the bottom, you realize it's a handle on an umbrella, which may, means if you put an arc over the top of the T, it would make a metaphorical umbrella. It would sort of be like an umbrella. It could also look like a, a rainbow or just an arc, but it would symbolize the merger. And I, I literally figured that out after we were briefed. And then uh, we were paid some money for these logo presentations that ended up being passed around Citibank for about a year until they finally agreed to do it. And then we made the components for it. And then we launched the banks, which my partner, Lorenzo Apicello, who's an architect, worked on with me. And this thing is a brand that's global and everybody in the world knows it. And recently it had its 20th anniversary as a logo and they made a little film on me and they sent it around Citibank. And nobody who worked there now knew it was because it was for, from a merger of travelers. It was amazing to me. Like none of that matters. But they, it's their logo and they've absorbed it and they've, they've, they've sort of described their own meaning to it. It means progress, uh, good luck, it's good fortune, prosperity. It means all those things. And you, when you made this quick design, if my facts are correct, it was on a napkin, correct? Always. They usually, oh, they're on a napkin, a piece of crappy paper that I have lying around or, you know, something. The crappier, the better. Save them in sketchbooks. Like a, whatever I'm drawing on at the moment is where the mark is. What is it about having a, a not so fancy sketchbook or 
crappy napkin that makes it a good canvas for sketching out ideas? So I'll tell you what my problem is with sketchbooks. It's like I'm, I'm sloppy and it, it takes me a while to get the drawing right, even though I get the idea right. So I'll draw it like really loosely in the book and then I'll hate it because I didn't draw it well. So then I'll like sort of scratch it out and redraw it. And I'll waste a lot of time doing that when the things I draw on a piece of paper are sort of right and I can interpret them just as easily as I can and doing it very neatly in a sketchbook. That's crazy. It does feel like a, like when you see a napkin or see just a, a piece of crappy paper, it does seem so natural to just kind of doodle and it's a more positive vibe to it than if you do have a more kind of like formal sketchbook, something like that. I never really thought of that before. Well, I've been actually, since I've been up in the country and I have to even do more sketching because I have to not just come up with ideas, but I have to correct use and draw back and forth with my team and I'm holding it up on a Zoom picture or sending an iPhone shot of it, I find I actually use the sketchbooks more. And I, I kind of like it because I like looking at them now, which I didn't before. But the problem is it's all, I don't have any order to it. So sometimes I draw on the front of the book and sometimes I draw on the back of the book and I can't find anything. And then I got too many books going at once. So it's sort of a mess. <laughs> I'm looking at them now trying to figure out, well, I made a mess of this book. It was a really nice little red book and I sort of just completely messed it up. See, Paul, you're becoming one of those bratty young people that says, oh, I'm never going to do something that way. And now you're doing something that way. This idea of a sketchbook has me thinking, what would a sketchbook look like for your podcast? If you could sketch out what the goals for your podcast are, what the audience looks like, what the artwork looks like, what the name is, what the description is. All these things are essential when you are launching a podcast for your brand, for your business. If that is something you're interested in, you can think of me like a sketchbook partner for your podcast. Together, we will team up to craft the perfect name, the perfect artwork, the perfect description, and the perfect podcast for you. Email me at max at hippodirect.com, and we will start sketching things out. Now, to find out more about how Paula does what she does. Let's switch gears a little bit. Let's dive more into inspiration and creativity. So when you are doing your creative design work, what are you doing or what sort of environment are you in that you think you do your best work? As a designer, I do my best work in, in, in the pentagram office walking around, you know, like I, just being on my feet and moving around. I don't sit at my desk and design, though sometimes I'll jot something down because I don't want to forget it. Very often, I can, I can describe my ideas, like we were, we were doing this project for the Mental Health Coalition that launched this summer, a project I really like. And they needed a symbol, uh, because the goal was that there'd be some kind of mark or symbol for mental health, and that it could be used by other organizations beyond the coalition. And this is already starting to happen, so it actually can be a symbol for mental health by itself. And all, it was a very simple idea. It's just a square peg in a round hole. And that I like the idea because it's how you feel when you don't feel right. You know, kind of not fitting in. There's always some edge to it. It could be really serious. Or it could be mild. I was working with a, a woman who was working for me called Emily Atwood. And, and I said, it's a square peg in a round hole. And first she made the, the square too little. And then she made the square too big. And then we made, and I, you know, I stood over her and then the square was just right. And then we did it and designed it, and she added typography to it, and the typography had to be weighted, etc. But these things happen very, when we know what we're doing, they happen very quickly. It's amazing how little time it can take to design something. It isn't the, it isn't the, even the, the perfection of it. Um, actually, perfection often ruins the design. Sometimes mistakes are good, and you want to leave them in there because they make something stronger. Uh, but really, it's the, the time to get it in front of somebody, to get their comments, uh, to do a million iterations of things, to prove it out. That's really what takes time. And that's not that difficult, but it is time consuming. Now, we designed the Mental Health Coalition. It was really called something else at the beginning. It was going to be called There Is No Normal. And then the name changed. And the, the client was the, the, the shoe magnet, Kenneth Cole who was doing this thing as a public service organization and he, he was building it as he went along. So that 
it launched in, uh, I think, late June or mid-June. Um, so that there was from September to mid-June that had all kinds of iterations and changes, where the thing really, if you saw what we did in September, it's not really that fundamentally different. Right. I think so much goes back to how quick these initial designs can be and how after so you know, sometimes after years of reworking, it still goes back to that original design. So it must, <laughs> that, that must drive you crazy. Like anything you invent, what you want to do is you invent this thing and you look at it and you think it's a really smart idea. And then you have to throw everything you can against it to see if it cracks. And if it can withstand that, you know, you've done it right. Yeah. I mean, I know from designers that I've worked with in the past, they talk so much about throw something up against the wall and throw darts at it. Like that same thing comes up over and over again. When you are, you know, quote unquote, off the clock, whatever free time you have, what sort of hobbies and, and things do you like to get into? Well, I, I, I don't know if you realize I'm a painter also. I mean, I paint these large scale maps. Um, I've been uh, painting the maps for about 20 years and I show them and uh, I have two galleries and we make prints of them. So it's like a, another, another vocation. And I had split my time. Right now, the whole thing is, is actually disrupted because I used to have a life that was designed for four days in New York City where I worked on a million different projects at once and had a very intense design life and did things on the fly and walked around from meeting to meeting and back to the team and back to the meeting and, and then go out to dinner at night and come home. And then on Thursday night, Seymour and I would go to the country and then I would start painting and I would paint my paintings are laborious and they take a really long time and I do them in quiet or I watch television when I'm doing it um, and they're slow and they're the absolute opposite of my city working life and the balance was very good for me creatively because I had the patience to do the paintings which take patience and um, it was a, a complete antidote to the kind of fast-paced life in the city. The problem now is I'm working out of Salisbury, Connecticut, because I've been here since COVID, and I'm working remotely, and it has killed my ability to paint. Because the two worlds don't disagree. Now, I'm not operating and walking around on the fly, except for I live completely on Zoom, so I'm talking to everybody all day long on a machine, and I'm talking to my staff and talking to my partners and talking to my clients and I, I feel completely burned out by the end of the day and I just don't even want to touch the paintings on the weekend. Well, sorry about that. Also, I, I had to go out and buy a big monitor up here, which I didn't have it. So now it's even easier to talk on the stupid device. <laughs> yeah. The yin and yang is so crazy to, to think about there, how one truly feels the other and what you're experiencing now is if you don't get enough of one thing, it can really impact the other thing. What else have you noticed is so different, but something you really like about the painting space versus using hardware, software, <laughs> using technology to come up with graphic design? Well, it's really what the difference between design and painting. Um, I mean, designing is, is collaborative. It always involves a client. It always involves the notion of specific expectations. Uh, you are solving problems. In designs, you give answers. In uh, painting, you don't necessarily resolve anything. Sometimes you're just asking questions. There's no beginning, middle, or end. Uh, you're alone, and what you put out is what you put out, and you determine when you're finished putting it out. And then you go on and make the next one. And that sometimes it lives in a vacuum and sometimes there's a show and people see it. And sometimes you sell it and sometimes you don't. They're just very different activities. I've never heard of painting as asking questions before. Now I'm thinking of podcasting like painting. So I think I'm seeing podcasting in a new light now. So thank you for that. Let's get to a fan favorite segment called the Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. The wild business shout out of the week. I'm good. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> wild business shout out of the week. This is where we typically talk about a creative marketing campaign that broke through the clutter and caught our attention. But when we were chatting about this, 
you were literally like, I don't really care about any of that stuff. So where does that come from? <laughs> you know, I used to be, um, I really liked looking or discovering things that I thought were smarter. You know, I would see things online that I thought were terrific or somebody would send me something. And I have to say, I have no room for that right now. Everything in my life other than making the things I need to make to keep my, my business going right now are really so much wrapped up in the condition of this country, the COVID. I don't care about a marketing campaign. It just seems completely trivial to me. My life has been upended in that way. And, and you know, I saw you sent, uh, sent me this as a question that I read and I thought, oh God, I can't even think of an answer to that. Um, because I'm not, being, I'm not being affected by it in the way I used to be. Yeah, I think what you're reflecting on is what so many people are experiencing is when it is crazy times and then it's like crazy times layered on top of crazy times, you know, seemingly infinitely. Marketing and advertising and things that are just more promotional in nature, it just doesn't feel like a good time for it. It just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense that it loses its meaning. And so in the business space and the marketing space, that's the challenge is like, is how do you come across genuine and do things for the greater good, but also make sure that people know you're still around and still in business and still here to help. So it's a really just absolutely nuts time for that. But I think what your wild business shout out, or we'll call it a, a wild business non shout out, I think is something that so many people are experiencing. I think straightforward information is great, particularly if it's something you need. It's not about being clever right now. It, it's hard. It's hard to uh, come off as not false in this in this sort of backdrop. So you know, I mean, I think that where where I I find myself even purchasing things more online is when. Uh, somebody sets up something for me that totally takes into account whatever the situation is, you know, and it's not about being clever. It's about being informational in a good way. Right. Yeah. That transparency and genuineness. And so let's wrap up with some rapid fire Q and a, you ready for it? Sure. All right. <laughs> right on cue. What is your favorite font of all time? Oh, God. <laughs> I hate this question. <laughs> You're welcome. Probably American wood type. Uh, there, there was a Morgan library, and they were defined by numbers. But it's, a, it's, a, it's a, just a basic cut of uh, American newspaper type fonts from the, that were mostly designed in the late 1800s and exist in all forms today, and everything comes from them. That's my favorite kind of type. It's sans serif, and for the most part, it tends to be fairly bold. That's very cool. What is something that your family, your coworkers, somebody calls you out on that's a little bit quirky about your personality? Well, one thing I do that one of my friends calls me out on all the time is I, I seem to be obsessed with my driving routes. And I always seem to describe what road I took and how you get to someplace. And I do that continually. And I didn't realize it until he called me out on it, but I do do it all the time. <laughs> See, you just have a natural love for maps and map and cartography you're meant to be a cartographer i love finding a shortcut yeah that's reflected in your work as well and speaking of your work you are used to seeing your design your work in tons of places but i think for for city something that maybe you didn't know about at the start was that that they would launch city bikes and that you'd literally see your logo on bikes all around New York City and all these places. What was your reaction to seeing your design literally flying through the streets like that? I love that. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't like the way they put them on the bikes and they coupled it with some bad type that I would crit them on. But I have to say, I love that they're there. I love that, that I walk down the street in New York City and, I, you know, I've done the parks department signage and the the High Line and the public and and buildings of just freeways that where you see the the type on the awning or the quad cinema or Parsons and the New School and I I walk around in my neighborhood and I've designed all these things that live there 
and it makes me feel great. And sometimes I even forget about it. I, you know, like sometimes, I mean, city, city is so ubiquitous that I just walk by it and I forget about it. Well, you definitely should be proud of it. And there's there's so many amazing things that you've created and, and your legacy just speaks for itself. But Paula, thank you so much. This has been amazing and really cool hearing your stories and insights and projects. Where's the best place for people to connect with you? Pentagram.com. Perfect. Easy enough. And then last thing, final thoughts. It could be a quote, a line, whatever you want. Final message. Send it off here. Oh, dear. <laughs> final message. <laughs> oh, dear is a good one. And when you the poo said, what day is it? And Christopher Robin said, it's today. Thank you so much, Paula, for sharing your story today. And thank you, wild listeners, for tuning into another episode. If you want to hear more wild stories like this one, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite app and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also check us out on Good Pods, where you can find all the podcasts your friends, family, and others are listening to. Explore what Hippo Direct has to offer at hippodirect.com, and make sure to connect and say hey or whatever your favorite corny greeting is at the handles Hippo Direct and Max Brandstutter on social media. Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos! Bongos!